deep within the Arctic Circle between Norway and the North Pole sits the archipelago of Svalbard, a group of icy islands home to reindeer and the world's most northerly settlement, with temperatures sitting well below freezing for the majority of the year, surviving here has always been tough, but things are shifting. The climate is changing faster here than anywhere else in the world. And one of the most obvious signals of that is the ice in this fjord. 10 years ago, it would have been completely frozen along this edge of coastline, but now the sea ice retreats year on year. For those living and working on Svalbard, it means environmental risks are on the up. Reduced sea ice means polar bears, which normally remain out of sight, are starting to push closer towards human settlements in search of food. For tour guide Mans Gulgren, it makes his work more dangerous. The gun he carries for protection of him and his guests now holds even more weight. He's seen firsthand the impact climate change has had on Svalbard's glaciers and took us deep within one to demonstrate just how serious the melt really is. A part of the Justedals glacier where I've been working since 2011, that's gone back more than a kilometer. Uh, and that's just in length, so it's also probably about 35 meters of height that's been lost. It's not uh, numbers that have been given, it's just by looking. Actually mm. physically seeing that impact day in, day out, how mm. does it make you feel? Um, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I've been thinking about this for uh, years and years, and uh, if I were to walk around and worry, which I do, but uh, I sort of have to shut it off as well because otherwise uh, it would just be too hard uh, seeing that nothing is actually happening. I mean, if we are basing our uh, uh, lives on uh, economic growth, that's what we're getting. And uh, I don't see anything changing soon. I think, unfortunately, that people will have to be affected before things will start happening. And it's probably the West that has to be affected, because we're the ones polluting the most. The pollution Munns is referring to is global carbon emissions. Their presence in the Earth's atmosphere, warming temperatures to levels scientists warn are reaching crisis point. It is perhaps a cruel irony that Svalbard's wealth was built on coal, the world's biggest source of carbon emissions. Its landscape still peppered with infrastructure used to mine the fossil fuel over the last five decades. The majority of these shafts have now shut, but one active mine still remains, scarring the white snow with black dust. For a community this remote, transitioning towards more environmentally friendly energy alternatives is a real challenge. This coal mine has had its life extended by another two years in a bid to buy some time, but making a green shift will require significant investment. And that won't be easy. Longyearbyen's community of 2,500 people are reliant on fossil fuels for their power and heat, almost 2,000 kilometres away from mainland Norway. But with the mining industry waning and tourism now Svalbard's main sector for employment and economic growth, demand for change is growing. Visitors coming to experience a snapshot of life in the Arctic increasingly want their own carbon footprint to be reduced and their activities to leave no trace. One company that has taken up the challenge is Hurtigruten. They offer snowmobile excursions using electric vehicles. Up here in the Arctic, we can see the effect of climate change well, every day. So uh, moving away to more uh, well, environmentally friendly, greener solutions is um, very important. These are, are electric uh, snowmobiles. So um, we charge them up with uh, solar panels and uh, a windmill. And uh, we can drive out here in the wilderness and it's quiet. And um, we have eight of them. It's sort of moving in, in the right direction. Despite best efforts, though, climate scientists living and working in this environment say weather systems are already changing, and adaptations to the way Longyearbyen's residents will have to live in the future seem inevitable. The snow is coming much later. It used to be, when you talk to people who have been living here for a long time, that the snow was settled in October, November, December time. Now it barely settled before Christmas time. And instead of having snowstorm in those months, we have 
storm, but in the form of rain. Other thing, it's the sea ice coverage. If you talk to people here, especially around Svalbard, the amount of sea ice is very diminished. 20 years ago, you could still drive and cross the fjord on snowmobile. Now it's impossible. And that affects the ecosystem in itself because ice is part of the marine ecosystem, but it also affects our ability to travel. For the 2,500 people living here, predicting what their future may look like in a changing climate is difficult. But at the community's church, Pastor Siv Limstrand tells me adapting is what those who come to live in this climate do well. Humans were not meant to be here. Uh, Svalbard is far too close to, to the North Pole and, and you can't... Uh, well, there, there are mushrooms, small mushrooms, you know, but you can't really grow anything. So everything has to be brought to us. So it is, in a way, we, are, we have created what we feel like, an, in a way, they're quite natural. It's natural for us to be here. It's a lot of normal. It's, nor, it's a normal life in many ways, but at the same time, it's not. She is alive to the challenges people face here, from sub-zero temperatures to climates and the industrial shifts that come with that, but says some fear the day will come when Svalbard may no longer be a viable place to live. People are realistic and they know, well, if there is no future, then there is no future. Then we have to do like people before us did. You move, you move on. For now, at least, this community is doing what it can to thrive in the face of climate change. Africa's longest river, the Nile, starts right here in Uganda and runs north that way through South Sudan, Ethiopia, Sudan to Egypt, where it pours its waters into the Mediterranean Sea. But climate change, pollution and human exploitation are exerting pressure on this natural resource, threatening the lives of millions of people who depend on it for survival. <laughs> A hot sunny day on Lake Victoria, the largest freshwater lake on the African continent and the source of the mighty Nile River. Asad Magumba has been casting his nets on these waters for more than 27 years. But he says the lake is no longer as productive as it used to be. But then I'm coming back to since Rwanda. It was 1996. Assad attributes the drop in fish harvests to the growing number of fishermen on the water driven by the rising demand for fish. Overpopulation is just one of the challenges facing communities along the world's longest river. The amount of water flowing into the Nile is controlled by a series of hydroelectricity dams built to support Uganda's growing energy needs. But some fishermen say the dams are blocking the fish from reproducing and moving freely. <laughs> Another issue is that many companies have set up factories near the shoreline for easy access to water. A recent study by pro-biodiversity conservationists in Uganda revealed that some of these factories release untreated industrial waste directly into the river. This wastewater channel flows from leather tanneries operating just meters away from the Nile. The highly polluted effluent is discharged directly into the river without proper treatment and residents here say the dirty water is killing fish 
and destroying breeding grounds. These fishermen blame the decline in fish stocks on water contamination, which they believe is a threat to their livelihood. Amazi Gashuka. Gaba Machafu every day. Tevianja Biagara, Nebitam Vira want to Nawanyida. The show could be Mazigano Garinga Marunga to Gakosa, Netuganua, Natagaina Bravo, my Nate de Gasuka. Experts in water resources say more waste means more harmful nutrients in the water, which speeds up the growth of invasive weeds like the water hyacinth. Considered one of the world's worst aquatic plants. The aggressive weed forms dense mats across the water surface, restricting water flow, blocking sunlight, and reducing oxygen supply, putting marine and wildlife at risk. Quality of the water will change, and the benefits associated with the good water quality, productivity of the lake in terms of fishery, will have to do what to go down. The situation has been exacerbated by wetland degradation caused by the cutting down of forests for timber to expand farmland. This is changing weather patterns and breaking the cycle of rainwater which also feeds into the Nile. The flow of the Nile has fallen from 3,000 cubic meters per second to about 2,800 in the past 50 years. Farmers downstream in Sudan who rely on the Nile to irrigate their crops are already experiencing firsthand the effects of low water levels. The UN attributes this to climate change and population pressure. <laughs> The UN predicts the Nile's water flow will decrease by 70% by the end of the century, the result of failed drains and increased droughts in the East African region. That's likely to create water shortages and reduce water for agriculture and electricity leading to major problems for those who rely on the river. Depending on rain-fed agriculture. So there will be instability, famine, reduced yield, productivity, and the suffering for the people. And that is already happening. It's already happening that many families don't have adequate food. Even immediately after the end of the season or the harvesting period, you see people, they are starving. Some communities are trying to change their fishing methods to adapt to the new reality. Judith Madudu is the general secretary for a Fishers Farmers Cooperative. She is also a fish farmer and part of a larger group of fishermen who came together to start fish farms on the lake in order to improve fish stocks. Here you can, you can have it at your own pace, at your own number of fish that you want, and you can sell it at your own price at whatever stage, whenever you want. You can sell it at nine months, one year, two years. So the availability of the fish is always there. But fish farms too aren't immune to many of the challenges facing the Nile. Uganda has already passed legislation to control and protect the country's water resources and catchment areas. But much more effort may be needed to keep the dam politics downstream, a growing population and climate change from slowly killing Africa's river of life.
catastrophic climate crisis. That's how scientists have described Australia's future. And this suburban street in southeastern Queensland provides a glimpse into that future. Last year, this region faced what was called a one in 100 year flood. And the UN warns that could now occur several times a year. It's flooded here so often, it's now deemed an unacceptable risk to live here. Residents who survived the destruction on multiple occasions are now watching their homes being torn down by the government. And experts say this is just the beginning. Throughout the day, the sound of demolition echoes through the streets. Children's toys lie on piles of rubbish. Family photographs have been abandoned. And metal fences line the pavement. These are the remnants of climate migration. And soon this entire street could be knocked down. This was Margaret Kloostra's home for 50 years. And this is the last time she'll ever set foot inside. Yeah, we go inside, eh? We go inside? Yeah. Here, she raised four children, ran her counselling business. It was, it was a beautiful room that helped a lot of people. And created her garden sanctuary. <sighs> this is what used to be the beautiful backyard. Yeah. Right. It's just horrible to see it now, it's really horrible. She nearly lost everything four times, a house fire and three floods, all in the span of 48 years. The water came in and, um, and it came halfway up the the windows upstairs and then it went down again and it came up and way over the roof and it was I think 16 meters 60 meters 40 it was like that for three days so once again you know that you've lost everything and it was absolutely horrible you see it again you get the same mud around and everything's lying down inside and you have fridges on the floor looking like coffins and everything's just lying everywhere and it's just not right. You look around and all you see is destruction again. Just destruction is gone. I don't have any photos of the kids and they haven't got anything for themselves, you know, to show their families, so. Yeah, all the colours run. Yeah, everything's run, yeah. You can't make out what, what any of them are, yeah. Soon, her home will be torn down by the government. She is one of nearly 200 homeowners in the state who have accepted a voluntary buyback offer. This suburb sits in between two major rivers and this street sits downstream from both, meaning homes here are some of the first to be inundated with water during severe wet weather events. The most recent was just over a year ago when one of the worst flooding incidents in the nation's history left more than 20 people dead, affected more than 200,000 homes and cost the economy more than 5 billion US dollars. Many have still been unable to get back on their feet after the devastating deluge, and this street is now deemed unsafe to live. The federal and state governments are working together with council to do a buyback. So it's the first time that's happened in our state, but we're working with our, our residents here for them to have a buyback so that they can have hope. Residents have received government offers on their homes at pre-flood values, which for many here hover at around $270,000 US dollars. For Chris Onyajum, his wife Ronella and their eight children, it's been a lifesaver. used to be our place, but no longer our place now, but it's for the best. The fondest memory is spending Christmas together. Yeah, and yeah. our son's wedding when everybody came. like. All family came, yeah. A buyback was, that was a redemption. When they mentioned a the buyback and the criteria and how it's going to work, we were just saying our Christmas is going to look good again. Yeah. That was the beginning of a long time um, mm. relief. But other owners say they felt pressured into accepting an offer. For Margaret, rising house prices and a tight market means for now she's left in limbo. It was the only option, yeah, that I had. If that hadn't come, I'd have had to come back here again and, um, and wait for the next flood.
The money I've got is it's not quite, we haven't got a lot of houses to, to choose from at the moment. It's a little bit awkward that it's not quite enough money to get another house. <laughs> um, so I've got some things to work out with it yet. But another big loss is the loss of community. So at this time it's very different because we're not coming back. Whereas in 2011 everybody came back and well, we didn't have any options. And, but we're all very supportive one of the other. And, and now they're not coming back and some people just go on forever and you don't even, you don't, you probably never see them again. And you feel there's a bit of a void there. Walking through these abandoned homes after a flood and before demolition is like stepping into a time capsule frozen in a moment of tragedy. There are remnants of life before, appliances in the kitchen, photos scattered on the floor and furniture covered in mud. The skeletal remains of what was once a dream home and what climate experts say could soon become the reality for many more across the country. According to Climate Council, by 2030, one in 25 Australian properties will be uninsurable due to extreme weather. We are all facing, you know, an existential crisis. We have to do something about it. We cannot sit back and just hope that someone's going to find a miracle cure. There is no silver bullet. We need to protect people's lives. You know, we're going to face extreme upheaval, both in Australia and around the world in the coming decades. It's, this is only going to get worse. The next is to think about the, ne the next level of planning. So where are we building future houses? Making sure our climate risk models tell us, you know, is this a safe place to be? We've, we've got to do the right thing by, by our society, by the environment, you know, and hope for future generations that, that they've got something to, to live for. Soon this street will be turned into soccer fields, beginning a new era for a suburb that has suffered so much. But the residents who built their lives here will continue to bear the scars from a climate crisis that threatens the rest of the world.